From the Software Craftsmanship of Henry County. Uh, a couple announcements before we get started. So first, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So follow up for the space. And um, we have the LaSalle Group sponsoring our meetup.com news. And uh, Rand and I are sponsoring pizza this month. Um, do we have a jar? Sure. <laughs> we don't have a jar. But, um, so next month, we will get this posted, but just to let people know, uh, we have a local attorney that's going to give a talk on the legal issues surrounding software development and contracts and that sort of thing. He actually has his practice is really focused toward that direction. So he contacted us and we said, yeah, that sounds good. So we'll get that posted pretty soon. Um, and then May is open, so if anyone's interested in giving a talk or knows about a talk, uh, let us know. Um, and then the last thing before I hand it over is just a reminder. There is a local election on April 2nd, so go out and vote. It's two weeks from today. Um, well, you can make a big difference in a local election because there aren't that many people who actually vote in them. So let's take a look at what's out there. Um, all right, I'd like to hand it over to Mike. All right, thank you. All right, welcome everybody. So I'm Mike Labriola, um, a company called Digital Primates, and tonight we're gonna talk about the ever-evolving, ever-changing Chrome Council. Um, the reason I say that is, uh, I, I jokingly said earlier, it wasn't actually so much of a joke, that uh, basically every time I open it, the first thing I have to do is reorient myself and what's moved around um, a little bit because there's a ton of functionality inside of uh, this Chrome console, but it moves a lot and there's small changes that happen all the time. Now, we're going to talk primarily about Chrome tonight, but many of the things we're talking about work in the browser of your choice. It's just that I think Chrome's got about the best, most polished version of how all these things come together. So for debugging purposes, it's really, really handy and it's really useful to have something to work with. So I'll talk about it from Chrome's perspective, but again, a lot of these things are transferable to something else if you wanted to. Um, that is the extent of our UI uh, that we're going to be working with tonight. Uh, we won't need much more than that in order to do everything that we're going to do. I like the uh, minimalist version of, of how this is all going to come together. So we're going to work with some, some very minimal stuff, and we're just going to dive into some pieces. Also, I got asked if I give this presentation, and, and my actual candid answer was kind of, um, because of the fact that, honestly, the, my presentation style is pretty flowing. So the questions that you ask, the direction we go, we could explore some very different topics tonight than we normally explore. We'll see how it goes. Um, we'll get through stuff. So please interrupt me with questions. Um, doesn't matter. You can scream at me, throw something, whatever that works. Uh, interrupt me. Let's go on. I'm happy to go into really deep detail on any of these parts. Um, some of you who've seen me present before know that usually the problem is I go into so much detail that I run out of time. Uh, but we'll figure it out. All right, so we're gonna get started by um, looking at this really spectacular web page I wrote um, in Chrome. And we're gonna talk about the debugging through a number of different steps. Um, a lot of what we're gonna do tonight is actually gonna come down to really basic sort of council interaction and small tricks and tips that go around with that, along with an understanding of how the debugger relates to those things. Because there's this really interesting ecosystem and relationship between what we can see, how we can debug it, and how we can interact from, um, from the, the Chrome browser uh, standpoint from the council. Out of curiosity, before I get started, just to hone it, how many of you do some form of front-end development? Okay, how many of you are strictly back-end devs? Okay, how many of you fit into none of those categories? <laughs> and what category do you fit into? Uh, prototyper. Okay, <laughs> that's great. How about yourself? Front-end, but going into Java. Whatever hat needs to be worn, I understand. Whatever about the job. The question that came to me earlier was if I was a front-end dev, and the answer is currently. Um, to an extent, I do a lot of front-end stuff, but my background is front-end, a bit of back-end, a lot of stuff that goes a little lower end, compilers, uh, pieces that are kind of lower, more compiled, lower level systems pieces. I used to be an embedded developer, and when I started in college, I was actually doing artificial intelligence. So it's kind of uh, been a swing career, but that's hopefully won't be as bad as our presentation. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is just talk about how to open the Chrome Development Console. Um, usually there's a keyboard shortcut. There's also, at any given point, either a right click, control click, or go to, and go to inspect, or you can get here through these little tool options that they like to hide and move around up here. <laughs> but the gist is, we want to get this thing open to see the wonder of my web page um, as we start and get started. Now, we're going to walk through each of these tabs a little bit. Um, we will definitely talk about elements and council. We're going to spend a ton of time there. We'll get to sources a little bit uh, because we're going to set some breakpoints and move in between them and do some things. But I want to show the relationship between these things 
And sometimes that's best served by seeing how these interact. We'll definitely spend a little bit of time in network, um, and we're gonna glimpse a bit at some of the performance stuff and some of the insights you can glean from it. And if anyone's interested and we have enough time, we'll talk a little bit about memory, but it can be more shallow. There's enough to fill up, um, plenty and plenty and plenty of things to talk about, just sticking with those first few tabs before we ever go anywhere else. All right? Okay, so once I'm into tab, I'm gonna get um, an interactive view, which is pretty cool, and actually like this open in the meantime the background. Um, I'm gonna get an interactive view of my tree and my DOM tree that I'm working with. And there's a lot of really important things going on here, including lots of little hints that we're getting from Chrome that everyone ignores. See that dollar sign zero there? Okay, that's a really awesome hint that we're gonna talk about in a moment. Um, pay attention to what's going on in terms of the UI, because I don't always like their UI design, but Chrome, or Google and the Chrome team is spending a lot of time trying to give you hints in terms of what's actually going on and what you can use in this UI, and they're all right in front of our faces, even if we're not necessarily paying attention to all of them at once. All right, so we can navigate through this DOM in a couple different ways. Well, wait, wait, so what's the yeah. dollar zero mean? You, I promise you, you, the dollar zero is a reference, and we are gonna be using it, but I, I promised to do the call back here. That was just okay. my pay attention okay. part. I wasn't just gonna be like, no, go figure it out on your own. <laughs> uh, no, I, I promise the dollar sign zero will be very, very clear, and many other dollar sign ones in your mind before we're done. Um, all right, so we've got two different ways that we're able to work through um, anything that we're doing over here. On our right-hand side, we can dive through any of the amazing code, other script things, and pieces that I wrote over on the right-hand side. Over on the left, I can actually interact with the real DOM as it's rendered, and I can choose to inspect things, which basically is an interaction between these two tabs. So things that I'm choosing over here on the left will get highlighted on the right. Things that I'm doing on the right will get highlighted on the left. The relationship between those two is what we care about right now. Um, and our ability to modify things is actually quite interesting either because all of the things, and we're gonna see this that we're doing are live. So this isn't some static environment where we're just sort of cascading or paying attention to it. Everything we're gonna do in console, source, and elements has the ability to impact the runtime that we are in at that moment and has the ability to interact with everything that we're doing. So we can change things, whether they be styles or real information or code real time as we're moving back and forth between these two. And that's the key to why this thing in itself is not only a debugger, it's not a good IDE, but it's an IDE as well in a lot of the ways that you can use it. So there's a lot going on here in terms of what we can actually see and what we can do. Um, in terms of here, when as a sort of starting point before we even get much further, just some of the little things that are hiding out that are kind of useful. Um, not only am I viewing this web page at the moment, uh, this amazing web page that I wrote over here, and that stopped. My cursor no longer is responding. Nothing's responding. Well, that's neat. All right. Well, we're just gonna give that a moment. See if it. it um, there, there you go. Whew. All right. I don't know if to play Chrome, my machine, or something else, but we're back. All right. A uh, one time during a presentation, uh, I was full screen, and I didn't realize that Windows was. Uh, doing this wonderful thing where it had decided to do a countdown because it was going to apply updates for me oh. in the background. And I didn't see it because I was in full screen. And I'm talking and all of a sudden my machine turns off. Um, it's going to just have some updates and thought that was an opportune time to apply them for me. <laughs> all right, in any case, so over here on the left, as I mentioned, I'm interacting with things, but I've got a number of things that it's giving me little hints on. I can select an element um, in the page to inspect it. So that was partially what I was doing. I can select elements over here and then I can stack them over here. But I can also view things and interact with pieces differently. So there's this whole devices toolbar that's built into Chrome, which actually allows me to see these sorts of things in different devices. And we'll play with this a lot more, but I can actually adjust screen resolution and size and I can mimic and emulate devices while I'm inside of here in order to play around with different aspect ratios and see what this web page would look like in an emulated environment. This is not the same as testing on a device but it's an emulated version of being able to test on and see some of what's actually happening uh, when we want to look at different device profiles. So we'll talk about that as we go through. This is my survey portion. I promise we'll dive in a little more. Um, but relationships. Relationships is what I want to talk about again. So as I come over here and say inspect on this, you'll notice that I can double click in any of the code here. And as I do so, I can actually change it. And as I do, I'm going to change live interactions with the DOM. Now, this is really useful for a number of reasons, the least of which is that I can debug and change things and do interactivity and replicate things back and forth. But it gives us a real sense of being able to encounter or find things. 
because over here on the left, if I just don't know where something's buried in the DOM, at any given point I can inspect it, and even in a relatively long DOM, it's gonna bring me to the place that that thing is actually defined. So conceptually, the same thing is happening over here, where if I choose anything that I'm highlighting, I'm gonna see what it actually relates to in the view, okay? And I can interreact inter with those two back and forth. Over here on the right, and we will talk more about this, um, but the CSS site isn't my focus right now. But over here on the right-hand side, we're seeing the CSS that actually applies to that element. Now, there's a lot of it, because there's a lot of it. Um, the elements inside of any browser these days, modern elements in CSS, are actually a cascade of style sheets that are applied, which are a combination of default browser styles that are actually applied at the browser level, and then a cascading set of styles that are applied on top of that based on your media and your device and where you're seeing it from and everything else. So you can imagine it's just a series of style sheets that are applied for you before you even get started. Chrome is reporting on those for us over here and it's giving us some really useful information. We can see that we're starting here with an element style and then we have these user agent style sheets which are based on where I'm coming from so it knows what my user agent was. And as we dive down through them, we're getting a bunch of information. Number one, what styles are actually applied and how I can dive into them. I can, if I want to, change things as well. We'll talk about that. It also is showing me what things are or aren't even used. In other words, this particular thing is completely useless. Although this particular style sheet defines padding in that way, it's being overridden by something later, so that style's not even applicable right now. Which, by the way, if you're debugging your own stuff, can save you from tons and tons of times of why am I changing this and nothing's happening, because it's letting you know ahead of time it's not using it. Um, so as we move down, we'll eventually see some of the ones that are more specific to Chrome, and we get this nice little view here, which can save you tons of time in showing what the element is, and what part is padding, and what part is border, and what part is margin, and what all of those relate to. And if you see the left-hand upper corner there, it's also changing as I'm moving through the layers to show me the relationship between all of these sorts of styles and what they actually mean over in the UI element. Okay, so as I'm hunting down these different relationships between pieces. Now, these are the individual style sheets. The really interesting part is when we get over to Computed. Because Computed is basically, this is, after I've done all the work, what your style sheet is. This is where we're at right now. So here are all the things that are applying, and I have the ability to do things, because they can get long, like filter these things down. And then, within here, I can go back to the style sheet where that actually came from. So from a computed style, I can understand this was why it's happening, and then without looking through all my style sheets, I can get back to where is this happening, right? And those are the relationships that I begin to talk about in terms of what we're trying to accomplish in sort of understanding these pieces. So we're getting a lot of information, but we're also trying to get some information about why and what happened. Is there a question? Uh, to me, that's the most useful one, is the expansion, because then you see... Absolutely. You see the inheritance, right? Yeah. You see the so when we're coming down in, the point is that after you expand it, now you're starting to get down into what made this style this. <laughs> in other words, what made, and identity is a tricky thing, but what made text align center happen? Well, here we go. This is how we got there, right? And then we can go back to the composited view of what it was that we were trying to accomplish to get here to begin with. So we'll touch on this a bit more, but the idea here and what we're seeing is that we're seeing the relationships again between the styles and the actual element on the screen. Now, in any of these things, as you saw, I could double click here and I can change it. I can actually do a whole lot more if I want to. Um, it'll let me change the HTML right in line and preview what's going on. So if I really, really, really felt completely unfulfilled and that if I didn't change this thing to a div in line instead of a button, I can go ahead and do that internal to here. And when I do, um, that rendering change will take place. And I've done it, right? I've changed it. So we can edit in here. We can do a number of different things and see the relationship between what we're doing, why, when, where, and how. One thing to note, this, in, this that we're seeing right here in this element view is derived. And what I mean by derived is it is the relationship between all the different things on the source side that Chrome has done to put something out here. So if I've added and removed elements, this is a reflection not of what I started with necessarily as in source, this is a reflection of the state at time t, where we are right now, okay? So the tricky bit of doing this is that if you have code that of course is modifying code and things are moving around as we're doing things, this can be quite a complicated mess of trying to keep track of where things are at. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so 
In here, let's go back, because that was a really complicated example compared to the other ones. Uh, that was index five, you can tell by the number here. Um, so we're going back to one. Um, one is a place that we're going to go through and we're going to play with the council a little bit. And I'm going to hop back and forth between these two, and it's going to seem a little over the top, but I'll tell you there's a really good reason to do it and why I, I want to see it, because this council and the related things that go with it is probably the most powerful piece outside of a real debugger, which we can talk about as well, that you can have in terms of debugging code. So I am going to, thank you very much, there we go. I am going to look at um, this fancy bit of code here, which uh, says that I'm going to log out an event when I actually click a button, okay? Now, we've got some pretty straightforward things here, but it's a great starting point for us to jump off into some of the things we can do. So I'm gonna close that as a starting point. I click this button, I log out an event. Okay, that's fine, that's not too fancy, but it does begin to show some of the interesting and exciting things that are happening. I didn't just log out a string. I logged out an event. And what I mean by that is that I logged out an object reference that I can in fact still interact with in various ways and drill down in properties into. So when we talk about logging in Chrome, it's a little incorrect to think about it just in terms of like your debug log or something else that you're coming from. Because what you're really doing is you're able to present, it's like another presentation here. You're presenting a combination of text and objects that you might want to be able to understand at a given point in time in code in order to be able to perceive what's happening in a larger environment, okay? So in this case, these are real. And what I mean by that is that if I log out an object that is somewhere in my app, I can use the console to modify and to do things with that object because it's live, it's a reference. Uh, fun side note, in case any of you ever get into doing memory debugging, if you decide to log something out in the console, you have a reference to it and it doesn't go away in memory. Not that that would ever take like a whole afternoon of time and want you to drink a lot, but that is the type of thing that can happen because those are in fact live objects. All right, so within here right now, we're using the most benign of these, which is console log. Um, and within console log, there's a number of things we can do. So if we click a bunch of timestamps or a bunch of uh, mouse events, we'll see them. But there's two different menus that we want to interact with. First of all, there's this little wheel as are often, or a gear as are often is in, in Chrome, which is going to show us some more information. And then we're also going to go into the more advanced menu, which they've recently hidden away. So within here, we have some choices. Um, we can choose to, and we'll get to this with network traffic, but we can assume to keep network traffic out of this log if we want to. We can choose to preserve it, which by the way means that even across refreshes, we'll actually keep the log. Very useful if we want to compare and contrast to previous things that we just did. We can save that log at any given point in time we want to which is really, really useful in terms of like doing a diff tool and being able to see two things that happened over time. <clears throat> we can group similar content, which is the Chrome default. Um, and you'll see this when we get into some sections later, but oftentimes when you get five or six of the same event in a row, you'll see a five show up over here because it's just done five of those so rather than clutter up your log, it's just collapsed those things together. But we can tell it it's not allowed to do so if we don't want it to. Um, we can do things like eager evaluation and autocompletes. So when I say autocompletes, what I mean is I can up arrow through all the things I've done recently and still see them, something that's very handy while we're going through it. And we can also do evaluations. So let's take this for example. We can say right here in the council, the council three plus five is eight, okay? As I start typing that again, it's already letting me know, hey, did you mean three plus five again? Because you seem to really like that and it's really important to me that I do the thing that you want the most. Um, before I even hit enter, it's also, already evaluating and told me what the answer to that would be if I hit enter in a moment. Okay, so it's doing eager evaluation right now to let me know what something is, which is actually kind of handy when you're just poking around and don't necessarily want to change something in the log, but you're just kind of looking for values or something, is you can let these eager evaluations happen and actually get some, some data ahead of time in terms of what's actually happening. Now, while we're going through this, one of the other cool things that we can do in here is we can understand the context in which our logs occur one of the things, and I talk about this a lot in, in different presentations, but Chrome allows extensions, and extensions are written in JavaScript, which means they're running in other V8 um, environments. So if you can imagine, if I'm on this web page, I may very well want to be able to debug or understand not just the main window, but I could have an iframe, I could have these other extensions and debug. So you'll see this in a lot of cases. 
This little context menu up here is asking you what it is that you want to be debugging and running within the context of. So in this case, I've got a few plugins that are installed. And so it's actually showing me the, co the context of the plugins I have and if that is where I want to be debugging or where I'm trying to contextually work okay, um, through the course of those. Now, additionally, and we'll get to this a little bit more, but we have the ability to filter. So in this case, um, there's not a whole lot of, of fun that I can do yet except for say, okay, let me see mouse events. But I, since I only have those, that doesn't give me a lot of information. But we'll get to that one. But I can filter any of my logs and then we'll talk about log levels in a moment. One of the things I actually find incredibly useful, though, is buried inside of this little more tools and sort of external settings things that you can have up in here. If you go to settings, you get a whole lot more. And these are additional settings, which are somewhat, but not completely, um, applicable to that screen as well. But these additional settings will show us a couple of other things, including one of my favorites, which for whatever reason they've recently buried, which is show timestamps. And what show timestamps does, it actually shows you realistic timestamps of whenever one of those log events happen. So that in the course of, again, trying to look at timing or other information in terms of when something happened, I can see the timestamps of when something occurred, not just that they occurred. Um, so timestamps are actually a really useful piece in terms of seeing things. I have seen so many developers go and litter their code with log statements, which also take a time and stick the time into a log message, and it's a setting. You go turn it on. Um, and it, and it, it does that for you. So um, putting those things in and knowing where to find those things is just an important part of understanding how to work with the tool. Okay, now these are log statements as we started pointing, and for anyone who's worked in other sort of um, environments, log isn't the only one that we have, and it's not gonna be a surprise, but we do have log, let's do these, warn, error, and there are some differences in, in what we're gonna do here. Uh, info is lost, right? Okay, so there are some differences in what we'll see. So we'll come back here for a moment, we'll refresh, and we'll hit that. And we've logged out all these things now in a default log level, a warn level, an error level, and an info level. Now, there are some cool things that come along with this, and it's more than just sort of syntactic sugar or, or coloring. The coloring does help, because it does help me quite a bit when I'm looking through this, figure out what I actually have to pay attention to. But we do get some extra pieces. For instance, when we actually throw something like this warning or a log, we actually get the line numbers where they actually occurred at um, and where that particular thing came from, which can be extraordinarily handy. And at any given time over here, which is true for all of them, but I can actually click on any one of those pieces and go back to the lines of code that actually did so and then see those same icons again. So as I mentioned on that concept of interactivity, from one side I can click on it and go see what the message was, but I know it was at this line that, it was, that happened. And on the other side from any one of those messages, I can come back and see why it was that I threw over what I did. So it's the interactivity between those two that actually is, is the cool part. Um, so in terms of um, going, to, uh, going through these, in addition to being able to just have the idea of what those sort of log levels are, I can also do a couple other things. Um, as soon as I have multiple levels, I have this cool little panel, and there are other ways to access this, which begin to show me what the breakdown of the warnings and errors I received in the course of a session were, so that I can drill down into just the ones I wanted to and see them regardless of how long a session was and in one convenient little place. Now, that's different than filtering, which does exist too, and we'll talk about it. But filtering, when we come back to it, is about the idea of saying, in this screen, I only want to see certain things. So in other words, I could say that in this particular screen, I only want to see errors. And that's fine, and that's good, and it's helpful. But that little side window I opened up is the idea that across a very long, huge log, maybe an entire session, I want just to collapse up the errors or collapse up the warnings and see the things that I want to at that moment. Okay. So um, log levels are cascading, meaning that, um, like much, many languages, Errors are the most severe. Warnings will include warnings and errors, et cetera, as we kind of go down in terms of log levels. And verbose will turn on everything, including the one message I didn't use here, which is core debug information. Now, where this is actually interesting, and I don't recommend that you just necessarily litter your code with all of these, but one of the things that is actually interesting is that Chrome can optimize some of these things out, and certainly, um, in uh, compilers and other places that we use these days in modern JavaScript, they can go even further. But in the case where we actually turn off the default log level with the debug, um, we can have a bunch of debug statements. We can have a bunch of things that are popping out there that someone can go turn on if they want to see. 
But we're not actually, we're kind of no up from them right now. We're not actually spitting them out to the council. We're not actually taking a bunch of time to, to kick them out. Um, so there are some good things about it. But again, remember that don't bury anything important in there because anybody can go, go look at it anytime they want to. All right, so log levels are one thing, and that's cool, but um, in addition to those, we can actually do things that are much more interesting. So we can do, let's just do this one. We'll do this one as log, we'll do this one as warn. Okay. And we start actually producing, well, only if I actually put all the comments in the right place. Um, so we start producing um, other sorts of messages which go out there. Okay, so you'll notice again something that I actually think gets really interesting, and we can control this even more in a moment. But even though I asked Chrome to log out two things, and I said, please log out the word log followed by an E, or warn followed by an E, or let's do test followed by an error. Um, even though I've asked it to log those out, these pieces are still separate, meaning that I can still expand and play with this mouse event independent of the warning and independent of the different pieces that I'm working with. So they're still sort of independent pieces in terms of how I'm being presented in this log. So separating a bunch of things in a comma, separated list, one often thinks is akin to the idea that I'm concatenating a big string. But that's not what's actually happening here. You're logging out a number of things, each of those things being on a line if I put them in the same statement, but those lines basically being dynamic entities which exist on their own. Okay? Now, once I actually have some different things in here, I can use things like the filtering criteria to be able to bounce back to what I care about or what I want to see in terms of longer log lists, which can be quite helpful. But I alluded to, and I think it's actually pretty cool, that you can do a lot more with these sorts of logs and warrants and pieces like this. In fact, um, anybody who came from a C background or similar will might remember printf and the myriad of printf statements that you can do. The log council actually has a number of those. There is a percent %o, which basically says I want to log out an object, or I can force something to be a string, or I can force it to be a number. So I can actually create these sorts of string-like things in a really interesting way in order to present log statements as well. So um, one of my favorite ones to do, eh, we'll hit it in a second, one of my favorite ones to do is just kind of show the way that we can do these by concatenating strings. So we can actually build up something and we could do log foo, but we can actually put something if we wanted to in the middle. Um, sort of like this. And actually, we'll get to that in one second. I want to hit one other thing first. So um, in the course of this, as we're going through, um, I have these sorts of mouse events and things that I've been playing with, and I think they're really cool, and I can do a lot with them. But there's something else that I did want to show here before I went out, which is that any piece of data that appears in here, I can right-click and store as a bool variable. And so that can actually be a really useful debugging trick as well, because I can take something, and let's say I'm in one area of the application, and I want to compare something or do some complex thing in some other closure scope or somewhere else. I can take it, I can store it as a global variable, and I actually have access to it later to go play with something. Okay, So it's kind of an interesting piece that this begins to allude to the fact that we are in very much a live environment here. Um, and to that end, one can write functions and execute those functions and do everything else that one can do in JavaScript inside this console because it is a full environment. And this begins to kind of allude to some of the power that we're getting to there. So if I were to store this as a global variable, um, Chrome would happily assign it to something like temp1 for me, which now I have access to wherever I go. The names are not particularly creative. Um, however, since we're in a global space, you are allowed to make even better variable names anytime you want. OK, so you're good to go. Um, now, those, go those variables are available wherever we happen to go. And again, the same idea, there's my happy uh, pre-evaluation where it's letting you know that should you actually evaluate this, this is what you'll get. All right, cool. So in terms of this, in terms of what's going on, um, I like to do sort of the evaluation and answer the question that we had before about what those dollar sign things meant. Because uh, there's actually a lot of cool things here. The Chrome actually does a number of shortcuts for us to like make things a little bit easier. So anytime we have dollar sign and underscore, dollar sign underscore refers to the result of the last operation that we did. So to that end, if we're doing a whole bunch of series of work, we can say something like, again, as I did, 5 plus 3, that's 8. Well, there's 8 if I want to add two more to it. And then there's our result, et cetera, et cetera, as we go on. Um, so basically, each time we're getting sort of an added, uh, an 
a uh, accumulator of the value or the last value that we were able to present. So these dollar signs are a number of interesting pieces. So dollar sign underscore is always the last result. Now, as I mentioned, when we go back here, we saw dollar sign zero. And so I'm gonna go ahead and select this piece and go back over the console and you'll see that the dollar sign zero moved. So here I was in the body, now the dollar sign zero moved. Well, if I come back over and type dollar sign zero into here, I'll get my button. So that's actually a reference to the last, to whatever I currently have selected in the elements tab, I can go over and select it. And when I go over and select it, over in the console tab, I have access to it. And again, it is a full version of it. So I can say dollar sign zero dot style dot color was red and change the button color to red because this is a fully interactive version of being able to interact with the DOM as we're sitting here right now. Um, if I go on and select something else so that now my dollar sign zero is Council, the paragraph council fun, don't worry, because dollar sign one is now my button. <laughs> and so on and so forth, back through history. So I actually have a stack of things that I am adding to as I do selections for it to be able to work backward in time. Um, I haven't tried to find out where the end of that stack is. Uh, to be honest, it's probably not particularly deep, but also I'm pretty sure that you'll lose track of anything you need to after a couple. <laughs> so you probably want to make a variable out of it and not try and remember all of your data positionally. Just a thought. All right. So um, the relationship of all these pieces in terms of these two tabs is actually very cool because we're, again, we're able to do anything that you want to, including, as you saw, set styles, do styles inside of the DOM, back and forth, and, again, do things over here. Like, notice that if we ask for, sorry, I meant to hit enter. If we ask for the style declaration for that thing, well, there's our CSS styles for that particular element that are right in line in much the same way we were talking about. Okay, so there's some pretty cool things that one can do um, in terms of how to interact with and, and, and go on. In fact, actually one of the little tricks that I don't know that ever I would recommend doing, but since you can actually log do JSON stringify right from here, technically one could take their style sheet or something else and go ahead and make JSON right in line if they wanted to and save it off somewhere else and do whatever they wanted to because anything you can do in JavaScript, you can kind of just do right from this console. Handy little thing, by the way, when you're pissed and debugging something that just doesn't work in some piece of data, I will write it out to a string, copy it somewhere else, and go look at it because it's just easier sometimes to look at. All right, anyway, random, random asides for Mike. Um, you'll get a lot of those. All right, let's look at our fancier example of index two um, as our next step. And actually, I, I guess we'll do the code preview version of it this time, which is that index two is an equally fancy um, thing. Actually, let's, let's unfancify it because I want to put some of this in it a little bit of time. So let's do this real quick and we'll go from here. So we're going to start with something that's just, again, a really simple idea of console.log. And we'll start with foo. And then we can do our event. Okay, so this will be very similar to what we did at the starting point. It's what we had before. So we'll go see our console and we'll do that. Great. We get what we wanted to see there. Um, the Notice, by the way, because I typed that JSON stringify, it was still keeping it there because I never quite evaluated it. So it didn't go away because it was nothing to clear because it was still anticipating not actually giving me a value yet. All right, so the console log's there, as I mentioned. Now, we can actually do some really cool things with interacting. So this is the part that I mentioned gets kind of um, printf-like. So inside of here, I can do something like event.type. And in this case now, I can say, no, I, I literally do mean that I want you to make this thing into a string for me. Okay, so just like I can inside of um, uh, inside of anything like um, C, where I would be doing these things, I can choose to I can choose to format this, but in that really convenient way again, where I can choose which parts are actually objects and which parts are actually strings when I'm building them out and together. So I can make these very dynamic log statements, but I can format them and put them together in ways that I want to that are sometimes equally helpful because sometimes I really do want string pieces, and sometimes I want to save them off somewhere, and sometimes I really want dynamic objects, and I can do either of those, whichever way I want to do that. Now, that's fun and good, but one of the big problems is, is that if I actually have a whole bunch of um, log statements, let's just do this. We'll do uh, foo1, foo2, foo3. 
So we got these and then we go off and we say we want to do a uh, call to foo. Okay, so we got a bunch of calls to, to, to our, our foo. Okay. Nothing particularly interesting there. We close this up to give us a little more space. But where it gets into the point is that we begin to have problems with context in terms of when something is executed, especially if we could get called from a number of different places. And this is where it gets really interesting in how it will allow us to do grouping. So what we can actually do is we can say console.group, and we can give this group a title. And so this will be event handler. And there's a number of different things we can go with this, and we can say console.group end. Okay, and in doing so, we'll actually get these set aside now into the groups that I want to in order to make things happen. And yes, um, if I were to go further and make a bar, let's do that. Mm, now it's not really gonna be coming bar, it's just bfoo. Um, and we were to do something like that in there, we could actually replace this one with a call to bar. And again, if we wanted to, we can nest the group. So we could say console.group foo group and console.group end. Yep, I thought I would hit that key wrong. So we can get nested versions that will, at any level, nest inside of each other and sort of begin to frame out the level and the depth at which we're navigating through things. Now that can get pretty cool. That can also get a little intense. Let's say that I'm getting just too many of those. Well, don't worry, because group collapsed comes to the rescue, which is that I can actually, by default, say that really, go ahead and keep that foo group nested and closed. And I only want to be able to go up and expand it if I want to see the data. But for the most part, I just care that I hit that group. Really useful for asynchronous code and event handlers. Especially when you're trying to figure out what got called from what. Okay? All right, so group collapse and group end is actually kind of a cool feature uh, that people ignore, and, and it makes me sad. Um, all right, so we have another number of other things we can do, um, including console.trace, um, which we can talk about actually in a little bit of detail, but we'll talk about it at the same time as we do console dot. Uh, what's a good one? We'll do the, um, to do, oh, sorry, that's actually a good one. So let's actually do that first and we'll come back to this. So console dot assert um, is just like a unit test assertion. So we can do any sorts of conditions. So we want to know if uh, 5 plus 6 equals 11, or in this case we'll do 12 because I'd rather see something like that. And no dummy. Um, so our console.assert gives us something that looks like this, where we can put assertion in our code. And the assertions in our code will give us not only errors, but again, when we expand them, we'll actually see where the assertion failed um, and additional information. Also, same way, we can template up and enclose those strings so that if we want to provide information about why assertions failed or what needed to happen, we can do it inside the message that we're passing along with it. So it says more than no dummy um, and might actually give me a little bit more useful information as we're going along, okay? Now, when we get into tracing and some of these other things, we'll talk about this in terms of um, pieces that are going to interact with this profiling tab. So we'll, we'll bounce back and I'll probably hit those together um, because there's a number of things, there are only two tabs in, and there's a number of pieces that actually kind of interrelate to each other. One thing that I do think is um, both cool, and I will never ever do it, but I'll show it to you anyway, which is why it is uh, copied right down here, is we can actually also use CSS. Um, in case you clearly need a background color. <laughs> um, and that, uh, I copy it because I, I won't ever type that. Um, but uh, you, can, you can also do uh, things like that if you really want to give your own versions of styling or something that's really noticeable, or if you absolutely need to figure out how to use a blink tag or something of the sort inside of here, <laughs> you can do it. If you want to see what that actually looks like, it's I clearly need a background. And as I mentioned, that printf sort of uh, C concept, well, a percent C is CSS. So I'm saying preface this with the CSS, background, color, done. Okay? Pretty cool what they allow you to do, even if I would hurt somebody if they did it in my code. Um, so, 
Sir, on the uh, cert, it still, it still, it doesn't actually stop the uh, flow, though. Correct. Yeah, okay. it's not an assert as in an a assertion, as in get me out of here. It's an assertion to the council. Okay, but can be very, very handy for debugging and pieces in there um, as we're going through. Okay, so um, relationship between these things again, I actually find quite interesting um, in terms of, of of kind of what we can do. Um, <clears throat> And, and bring this all through. Um, I may have mentioned before too, but like some of these things, you'll. I guess we'll go through that. We can actually see stack traces. So let's do a trace, and uh, this all failed. And it might take some, maybe takes value too. We'll find out. Okay, this all failed, and in this case, I have very little code. So let me actually move it up into bar, so that we can see something just a little more interesting. So. What we're actually seeing, okay, or not uh, at the moment for interesting. That's okay. The idea behind trace is that it allows me to actually give a stack trace or ask for a stack trace at any given point in the code. So if you imagine a, a function that's not literally one line long, um, I can actually ask for a stack trace at a given point of how I got to this piece of code, what I did in order to get there. Okay? It's um, better than just throwing the exception, which is what I actually do. Yes, it is better than throwing the exception because the code still. Um, but yes, throwing the exception, try catching it, logging it out, <laughs> does work. I might recommend you look at console trace instead as an, and as an alternative opportunity at getting in front of that. Okay, so let's look at this really quickly, which is um, a really simple one, but really cool, um, which is our first time that we'll actually pull down a little bit of JSON. And we'll do this from two perspectives first. So in my console here, I went and got 100 records of JSON, um, which are terribly useful. And while this is live and I can see them all, and it is useful because I can dive into them if I want to, um, it's still a little hard to kind of see. But that's okay, because we have a couple other things like console.table, um, which are really handy. Because console.table will give me a table of all the data that I actually just saw back. But that can get a little tricky, because as you can imagine, sometimes those tables could be kind of wide. but. If we come over here and said, you know what, I really need to see the ID and what was the other field called? We'll call it title. And those are the two fields I really want to see. Then I can actually get something that will just give me a filtered list. But if I want it down here at the bottom, I can still actually get to the original array with all of the data. So it's presentation layer only ability to filter down into any of these things. Um, this is related actually in some of the things we can do. If we wanted to, we could say console.dir, and we should be able to do this. We're flying, we're going blind here. We'll just try it. Yeah. So at any given point, we can also just get sort of the more directory style listing of what an object is. This one's not as interesting, but if you can imagine, this is that console.dir. If you have a big nested object, you can actually just say, give me a nice directory sort of view of a complex object. There's also an XML version of this. So if you have an XML node, you can basically say, hey, give me that you know, description as XML, and it'll be like, yeah, here you go. Here's what it looks like if I wanted to show you this nested node as XML. Okay? All right, so that's actually kind of an interesting one, and actually, let me try uh, dir XML. You know what, we can maybe, we'll do it two ways. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're flying out here a little bit. So that one's less interesting. Let's try and do the whole response and see if that comes out. It may not, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll stick with what we had. I like table better. All right, so, um, all right, so this is part of the idea, though, of some of the things that are being built in, in order for us to do. Now, we are going to get to this in earnest in a moment, but this is where we start bridging back and forth to this network tab, and we're going to look at it for just a moment right now, and then we'll kind of come back into it in a little bit. When I click this, you'll see that over here in network, just for a moment, I really have two sorts of requests I've done so far: loading the index. And then I loaded these posts. And I can see that one of these was, if I expand this in a moment, type document. One of these was an XML HTTP request. Um, I can see who initiated them, what the size was. And although I was a little slow at loading this, um, so you'll see that over here I did some loading. And way down here in the waterfall, I did something else. If I go a little quicker just to get us a little closer together, um, we'll see a little more on the screen that we kind of begin to see the waterfall of when these things happened, including how long each request took what part of each request was waiting, what part was content downloading, how the relationship between those happened, um, and when and where. And then at any given point in any of these views, we can dive down into just seeing a section, 
highlight it, or we can filter to only see certain types of requests that we want to do. Okay. Uh, and again, obviously, there's always, and we'll say this over and over again, there's always, basically on every one of these screens, some ability to do a filter um, in order to do pieces. We can also uh, do all kinds of other things that we will talk about a little bit more. Like, hey, what types of presets do we want to apply and pretend like our data is coming down over 3G? Um, or these different sorts of pieces so we can actually throttle a little bit in terms of what our requests might look like so that the person who goes and does the super high uh, fidelity presentation with no bandwidth would have a sense ahead of time of what was about to happen to them. All right, so the, um, the relationship in these is again pretty interesting in terms of what we see. Uh, we can see everything as individual requests or cascading requests um, in terms of what we do as we go backward and forward. But let's get to that as a whole section on networking. At the moment, I want to show you this. And this is my favorite. Um, okay, they're all kind of my favorite, but this one it really is oh, my temporary favorite. So, um, well, because 34 doesn't exist. But I bet you if we don't replace the period and put a 4 in instead, it'll work a lot better. And I was right, it did. So, there is index 4. Um, and index 4 is, again, a very fancy high tech web page. Um, with this do something in it, and um, again, my script tag is going to increment a count. So let's look at it over here where it's a little nicer. Um, that's bugging me, so we'll get rid of that semicolon. And we have do something. We let a count equal something, and all we're going to do is increment that count and also set the inner HTML of a button. So when I click it, that button is going to become high. Okay? And those are the, the things that we're going to do. So, my demo Chrome. All right, so we'll go back in here, get that, good, comes high. All right, now what I actually wanted to show you with that, which is Chrome trying to spoil it, but is the relationship between how all of these things work with source and breakpoints. And this is extremely interesting in terms of how we can do these things. So in, we're in the sources tab right now, so we're in the third tab over, right? So we're actually looking at the source. Now within the sources tab, we have the ability to set breakpoints first and foremost on any line of code that we want to. Um, so within here, we can say, we want to set a breakpoint on count. When we click the button, we'll get here. We'll be able to not only see what happened in terms of count, where it was loaded from. This is what some of these clues are giving us when we see these, these pieces up here, where it came from, where we got that file. But we'll be able to see a combination of any variables that are in scope, the script itself, any global variables of which there will be many. Um, and we can see the call stack on how we got here. We got here from that to here. Um, to be able to bounce back and forth, and we can set up any sorts of watch variables we want, all of which are still set up from probably the last time I did debugging in here. So, while we don't need to do this because we'll see it under local variables, we can say count, right? We can do things. You'll notice that when we do this by default, it also opens a little console window, a smaller version of it, <coughs> underneath the debugger. And that's because it's not unintentional, it's because of the fact that down here, we actually have the ability to interact with these things as well. Um, and do work that we might like to do in the course of, of playing with these variables and interactivity down here. So we have a very interactive environment between the top and the bottom of the screen. All the things that we talked about are still there. Now, breakpoints in themselves are great and they are very helpful. They're more helpful though when you can apply conditions to them. They're more helpful if there's a reason or some other way of getting to it. Like, I don't necessarily want to stop, let's say I run through this a thousand times, I don't necessarily want to stop on every version of count. But maybe it would be really important to me to stop when count is equal to four. And now I get an orange breakpoint, which is conditional. So one, two, three, there. I'm in. So I can set conditional breakpoints. Now the cool thing about these conditional breakpoints is they are any form of predication you can write. Now what I mean by that, projection function is any, or a predicate function is any form of projection function, something that takes one thing to another thing and returns something on the domain of true and false. So anything that can return a true or false is a predicate function. Right now I get a really simple one. I can do anything here. Anything that is valid JavaScript, I can write. I can filter an array, check to see the existence of a value, and if it's true, go ahead and break point here. So whatever I can do that I can write in JavaScript, I can click here and it'll stop if that expression is true. Insanely powerful when you get to how to debug things. Um, I watch so, and myself included, I'll, I'll do it sometimes too, but I'll catch myself going in and writing an if statement and putting a debugger line or something like that in the code, um, but it, really this is pretty powerful. Now, because even though I just advocated against the practice, you wanna know how to do it, because I still am comfortable with you knowing how to do it even if you shouldn't. Um, let's go ahead and uh, look at two other things. 
Anytime that we want to be able to, from a source level, tell Chrome to stop, we have the debugger command. The debugger is basically a source code breakpoint. When it hits it, it will stop. So if you have a particularly crazy, deep, nested area of your code that you're just not sure how to get to and want them to stop at it, well, there's debugger. And combined with a lot of the other tools, it can be pretty cool in terms of what we can do. But debuggers are source. And that means invariably, I always have to keep changing the source every time I want to add one or remove one, which is why ultimately, breakpoints are a lot easier, okay? Now, breakpoints can be conditional, as we talked about. They can also be either enabled or disabled. So if you'll notice in here, and it's a little hard to see on these side menus, but I can disable breakpoints, which makes them a little paler. Um, just means the breakpoint's still there, but I can get back to it later. Over there on the right-hand side, you'll see that it actually lists out any breakpoints I've set, where they're at, and allows me to enable or disable them over here as well. Um, reason for that is that I don't necessarily want to hit every breakpoint every time, right? Um, and it gives me the ability to sort of modify and interact with those pieces. Now, again, source code breakpoints, cool, good things. I can do a lot. This is a very interactive environment. And a lot of times, I want to do things that have some interrelationship with the elements that are not strictly just source, right? Or at least I don't know what the source is. So the really cool thing is, is that um, we're allowed to interact with things in, a, in another way, which is that we have, for instance, this whole DOM concept. So over here in our button, if we right click on it, we can also see this other subset of breakpoints we can set. So we can set a breakpoint anytime any part of this subtree is modified, any attribute is modified, or anytime that mode remotes node is removed. In fact, it will break it just before it happens. So I will get the line of code that is about to remove that node. I will get the line of code that is about to modify the subtree. So if you want to see how that works, we'll go ahead and say subtree modification, because if you remember, when I click this, it changed to the word high. When I do so now, it stops me at that line of code and specifically saying, hey, we're about <laughs> to modify the subtree. If you step forward any further, that's what's about to happen. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner, it's actually saying pause on uh, subtree modification, and specifically because the first thing it was doing is removing the text and adding the new one in, so it's paused for us and told us that it's going to break. So you now can sort of set breakpoints from the perspective of either the code you know is doing something or from the side effect that you see that happens to work your way back into the code that's doing it. Okay, so you can kind of work from either direction. The same thing is true. Um, and much the same, these are, um, let me close this up, just give us a little more room. These, you saw the breakpoints were listed over here. You'll also see that in addition to um, breakpoints that we saw there, we also have DOM breakpoints. And we can do similar things, um, which we can get to, but we can set breakpoints when a given XHR request comes in, uh, or if the request that goes out to get some data has a certain string in the title, so I can break when I happen to go get ready to get posts. If I go to set those, by default, it'll ask me, break what the URL contains, and I can do it, and if I just hit enter, it'll break on any of them, okay? Now, all of them can be enabled or disabled in the same way. And there's one last one that's actually pretty cool, although, um, to be honest, it's, it's cooler in theory than it actually is in practice, but I'll show you anyway, because it's, it's there. But it, you know, it's one of those things that sounds like it's gonna be really useful, it's, it's okay. Um, which is that any of these sorts of targets, I can also, um, that I'm looking at, I can also um, break on their event listeners, meaning I can, in a given case, say, you know what, let me know any time that there's a mouse click event on an item that has a handler for it. And if I do that, and I come over here and click, I will actually get a breakpoint just before the click event is about to be executed. Now what that actually means is that you can think of event listeners as a list, okay? If you want to listen to an event, I'm dispatching, you add yourself to the list, you add to my list, everyone gets added to a list in a priority order. And then as the event happens, I start walking through each one of these individual pieces of code that needs to be notified. This is breaking when the event happens before anyone is notified, which means now if I want to, I can start walking through the list of everybody who's being notified in the order that they're actually going to be notified in um, and see who is understanding and what's happening. Now, when we get into some of this layer of debugging, we sometimes are walking into a little bit of what I call, it's not truly, but it's sort of the JavaScript that runs and does some of these pieces for inside of Chrome. 
um, or at least we can see it. So we actually are literally deep enough now where we're going to see things like, okay, it's checking to see if it has a function, and then it's going to check to see if the property exists on the object, and it's going to do a bunch of these other sorts of things. And that's why I mentioned that even though this is really useful in one way, it takes a little longer to use it because there's a fair amount of stuff you have to bounce through in order to figure out where it's at. But it can be insanely useful because you are in front of all the things that you're used to being behind when you're trying to set a breakpoint somewhere else. So conversely, if I were to set a breakpoint in my event handler, I will eventually get there, but I don't know what was called before me, I don't necessarily know what's going to get called after me, and I don't really understand the state of the, state of the system as a whole. This is one way I can understand it. Um, it's also another way, technically events are cancelable in some cases, meaning that if there are multiple event listeners, somebody who intercepts an event first can say, no, don't pass this along. It happens a lot with uh, accessibility and sort of other concerns where you can cancel an event. Here we can at least understand there was an event, something happened, there was a reason I didn't get to it back up. Okay? All right. So, um, down breakpoints, really neat, really cool. Um, we can do some other things with breakpoints too, and we'll do this by doing the uh, version of, of throw an error that we talked about a moment ago. So, uh, we will throw an error um, in here anytime that we click something. So, great. Um, let's go to the console. There's our error. Okay? We threw an error, we got our stack trace, that's fine. Now, sometimes in a big system, we throw errors from lots of places, but the system actually continues on and goes on with life. Um, sometimes that's desirable, sometimes it's not. So we do actually have the ability to do a number of other things, and it's this little guy up here in the corner, which allows us to pause any time an exception is generated. So within the system, anywhere that an error is about to be thrown, I can choose to pause. And in that case, I hit this, I go there, it shows me it's about to throw this error. So it's not after it threw the error, when I've already lost the context and the stack and all the things that I might have wanted to know about what was going on, it's letting me know it's about to throw an error. Okay? Additionally, and I think this is actually really cool, I can actually also do this. Let's say that some developer was being really nice to me and they just decided to catch all the errors so I will never see one. That way, everything will be better. Um, so in the case that I actually want to do that, I have the ability to actually say, hey, I want you to pause on caught exceptions as well. And assuming that I actually do everything I'm supposed to right here, um, if I pause on, pause on caught exceptions as well, oh, okay, be warned, your browser and every framework in the world throws 300 uh, <laughs> exceptions on startup. But if I pause on caught exceptions, even though that was going to be caught and it was never going to make it to the surface and no one else in the world is ever going to know it was going to happen, I still actually got the opportunity to stop and look at what's going on. Really cool, really useful. Again, if anybody is actually using a framework out there, it is common practice for everybody to like internally uh, check and see if a property exists and try and execute a function and if it doesn't, it crashes and they catch that error and then they're like, oh, well now I know I have to polyfill this. So you get a lot of these, but it can be really useful in the right circumstances. Okay? So that's how the interaction of that particular piece is working um, and getting this. So there's a lot there with just breakpoints in itself um, in terms of, of what's going on. Oh, I almost forgot one thing. This one is one of these insanely cool little weird things that in the right use case is fantastic and most of the time no one will ever use. But hey, we're here. So the uh, I can, in this case, Anywhere in this code, if I go ahead and run and I set a breakpoint, I can say, you know what I want is I would like to, from this point on, I want to debug foo as a function. Okay? And now, anytime foo gets called, wherever it is in the system, I want a breakpoint on its first line. Okay? So now I've removed my breakpoint from down here, but when I click that button again, because I've declared foo as something that I'm really interested in and want to know about, I'll make sure that every time I call foo, from wherever I call it, I happen to actually get a breakpoint. You can do that for any function that's in scope, meaning it's actually kind of hard to do from the console log with, uh, by itself in any sort of complex system. But if we set a breakpoint somewhere in the code where we know what we want is in scope, then we can say, okay, now this thing is what I want, and I want to make sure I have a breakpoint for doing so. All right. Let's hit this. And by the way, um, feel free to tell me to shut up because I didn't ask you intentionally how long I got to talk. Um, so, but I will stop when you want me to, I promise. All right, so really quickly, 
Um, I wanted to show this as a um, beginning idea of sorts of the things that we can begin to look at from a, a profiling standpoint. So uh, we talked a little bit about timestamps, and we talked a little bit about how those were useful before. But it turns out that Chrome actually does a number of other things for us that can be kind of useful, including, hey, let me know when something started, and let me know when something ended. So if I'm trying to ter determine the time between two things, I can actually get a sense of how long things took with really precise measurements, as opposed to trying to create a new date and subtract it from another date that I saved later in the system and have to get back to. Okay, so, counts, so Chrome does this by label. You give it a label at the beginning of time, of time, and it basically counts the time between any of those two labels, so any labels that you want. And these labels can be dramatic, are dynamically constructed as well, since they're just strings. So as we are nesting potentially down, we can pull something off the event or something else to help distinguish the labels as we move in. Um, we can also do two other things, which I think are cool here. Uh, and they are a little bit askew in terms of like how this all works, but I think it's a good time to get into that. Um, Council.count is a really simple one. Um, we can actually just do um, things like tell me the number of times, which I'll spare you at the moment, but tell me the number of times this ran. Um, little things like that, which can actually be useful in debugging things as we go along. But where I really want to get to is timestamp, and then we're going to get to profile, probably in that order. All right. All right, timestamp is one of these sorts of things which seemingly does nothing. Um, so, great, I ran my code with timestamp in it and I didn't see a whole lot of information. But that's because we've now bridged another direction in this whole profiling thing, which is we've bridged over to that performance tab, okay? And begun to talk about how Chrome is seeing itself in this whole environment that serves as starting up and running a web page. So this profiling tab, which in itself is like a doctoral thesis on how to get to, um, but we can go in here and we can say, you know what, I'd like you to start recording for me, and then I'm going to click do something, and then go ahead and stop recording. And everything that happened in that browser, including all the memory that was allocated, the individual events, the pieces that happened anywhere in between, is all recorded in the course of that time. And I can look at any of these things, I can zoom in on any of these things, and figure out what happened over a range of time or, or what was happening. Um, this is just JS heap memory. So if I, it's actually hard because I have my screen zoomed in right now to get to everything. But if you can see, you can actually see the interactions, let me try and get in here, and the timings of what was actually happening on the interactions on the timeline and what was going on. You can get down to the point where you can understand how much time it actually spent uh, scripting versus rendering versus painting the screen um, in that given loop that you wanted to do. But also, there's this little thing I call timestamp, which is that a timestamp basically lets you put a little marker anywhere on this timeline so that you can see when something happened. So what a timestamp is doing for me is it's allowing me to potentially take something in this big, long series of things that I know happen, and maybe I just need a breadcrumb, a way to find myself a way back to something that happened in this big, complicated system. Timestamp throws a marker on here that I can go back and grab and take a look at so I know where it happened in relation to everything else that was happening in this whole big timeline. So it's interactivity in the other direction now, which is how do I... How do I give myself away in this huge mess of data to be able to get back to what I need? Make sense? Keep going down, down, down. Anyway, it's very cool. This this can take a long time to go and just play with, and this is just the beginning of it. But um, there's a ton of really useful information and really cool stuff that happens inside of here uh, when we do this, including we didn't get to all of this, but call truth, what what function called what, how they went through, where things were at. Um, and this is a very simple example, so it's reasonable to look at these things right now. But as you can imagine, it gets a little intense to see the function calls, the layers, the painting, when timers fired, what happened, the order of which things were called in, etc. And there's my wonderful foos. Okay? Which, by the way, clicking on here, I can get to up here. Okay, so those are what timestamp is doing. Now, it wouldn't be complete if I didn't make it harder. So, um, when we go through, not only do we have timestamp, but we have these other cool things too, which is we have console profile and we've got profile end. Now, profile is when you really, really, really just want to get even a little deeper in, so deeper. Um, let's say that in the, this area here, I really just want to profile just this one little section of this one little function, and I just want to get some information about what's going on in here. I can run that, 
And then there's another secret little hidden tab full of menus over here with more tools that we didn't get to yet, um, which are all the tabs that couldn't fit across the top. Um, and so these are a whole bunch of additional things you can do, um, including things like blocking requests and stuff, which are very cool. I also get down to this JavaScript CPU profiler. And because I logged a profile called Deeper, I have a profile over here where I can actually see the sorts of things that were happening in sort internal to there. So if I want to make this a little more fun, let's give ourselves a little more data to do. We'll go ahead and we'll put that one there and we'll run it again. All right, so run two shows all the things that happen between those two markers in terms of a profile. How much self time, which is the time that a given function ran, versus how much total time, in other words, that function plus all the functions it called ran. And then I can dive into each of the things that are happening, what was going on, and see how much the relative time, and in some cases, how much memory they were actually taking to do those pieces of work. All the way down to the very tiny littlest thing I do at the bottom, which happens to be my function, which is comparatively nothing compared to all the stuff that Chrome had to do to get us there. Make sense? It's actually pretty cool when you dig into here and see all the data that's going on and, and where you can get in um, in terms of the, the information and just the raw amount of data that's available to you should you really feel like you want to see it. So that's what Profile does. Profile is, think about it just a lightweight version of that whole profiler, but narrow it down to a given function that you can specify where I want to do things. And again, we're looking at things that are, you know, our whole time here was 1.1 milliseconds in some of these cases, so we're looking at a pretty narrow slice of time and the things that happen on each side of those things. All right, index six. Index six is my cascading example, which I find fun for understanding a little bit about what's happening on that network timeline. Um, so let's, oh, I didn't uh, show these two really quickly. Um, this button, anytime you see it, is collect garbage. Um, doesn't really matter unless you're getting into memory profiling, but it's basically saying, hey, run your garbage collector and clear things out. And most of the time when you see things like this, it clears things. Some of these screens, the less used ones, they have bugs. And they don't always clear out until you close the browser. Um, okay, so if we go back to network now, we have our initial document load. And you'll notice the same things can happen here. We can record, we can capture screenshots of what actually was happening during the course of time when that network request happened. Um, so we can see oftentimes what a user did, which actually I didn't mention on here, but it is kind of fun even on here that if I go through a lot of these things, I can actually see, try again. Um, if I go through a lot of these things here, I can actually do the damn button right this time and see, and I will actually get all of that sorts of information in here as well. So all of these profilers do accept and need a much bigger screen but do accept and show the ability of screenshots. So while they're very small and very non-interactive in this case, you can see what my screen looked like at any given point there. And if you zoom in far enough, sometimes you can even see like mouse and interactivity, which give you clues about what was happening when somebody made that request. Okay, very, very handy. But going back over to network for a moment, let's go ahead and refresh this. And we started with this piece. Now, what this code does here in our index six is it really just basically says, I want you to load some data, and then as a result of that, I'd like you to load some data, and as a result of that, I'd like you to load some data. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is because I want to show the idea of cascade and waterfall and what's actually happening inside of here. Here, one second, please. Do, 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 do. There we go. OK, so we've got a number of different things in here. We can see the URL, and we can filter and do all the things we'd expect. We can see the time that these things happen. And then we can see the waterfall timeline of when and how interactivity happened between these different pieces. So we can see what was sent, what was retrieved, the download time, what actually came through, but we can get a sense in the app of time, what started before when, what cascaded, what finished, and what order, and how things kind of were moving through. We can see this in terms of a number of different pieces. Um, we can uh, group it by what happened in a given frame, we can preserve this again across the idea. We can even simulate us going online and offline if we want to be able to understand what would have happened if we weren't online when that request was made. So we can either simulate errors or if we have fallbacks and things like that, we can actually simulate what would happen in those cases in order to be able to see what happens. In any of these requests as we go through, we can see um, right now that this request was here. And let's actually do this one, not that one. Too many clicks. All right, if we go and click on that particular response or that particular request, we can see the headers 
the information, the response headers, the information that was presented through. We can see a preview or what the actual raw response was, any timing information, and my absolute favorite feature is I can right click on it and in any of these I can say copy it as a curl request and it'll actually copy with all the headers and all of the information that I need to do. So if I want to go to another tool and post that thing out there uh, and try and replicate that request on my own, I can copy it as a curl request. Let me tell you that has saved me many, 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 many hours of time. So I can take a look at all of these and these pieces that are going on in between them, but I can also see right now that all of these were 200s, okay? Which meant that every one of these things, it loaded by itself. And that's because I have this disable cache button on. Disable cache is telling it, I don't want you to pull anything from the cache, I want you to make a fresh request for everything so that I'm not in cache hell. But I can turn that off. And then I can actually start seeing more interesting and real behaviors in terms of what might happen. Because when I do it this time, and I actually were to go through, and let's do this, you'll notice a very different sort of relationship between these graphs, because these <coughs> second ones are gonna actually have come from a cache. And if we actually go through, we'll find out that these were returned um, from a cache as opposed to actually being returned directly. So we can see some pretty cool things in terms of what the relationship is in terms of how we, we load the pieces and what we did. Um, as I mentioned across the top, we can, these are just quick filters, you can filter your own stuff too, but we can filter just for XHRs, which I'm doing right now, so I didn't want to see HTML, but just JavaScript, CSS, images, any other forms of media, fonts, docs, manifests, etc. Whatever we want to actually see, okay? So the network request stuff's pretty cool, and again, that concept of screenshots as we talked about will actually allow us to see the relationship between when things potentially happened on the screen and what requests we actually made. Uh, one of these things, I forget which screen you're in, but it, I know I've worked with this before, and it says provisional headers are shown. Yep. Maybe, what's your explanation for that? So I'll show you where it's at, first of all. There you go. So when you're actually saying this, yeah, right? Right. There you go. So the provisional headers are, are um, provisional headers are shown. So uh, in this particular case, we aren't actually serving from a big or a real web server that's actually giving us back full responses. We have like the dirtiest, tiniest little thing. So we're just being given back a standard set of headers. Um, we're not actually getting more information. I'm sure it even means more in terms of that, and we could dig in, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. So um, the, uh, uh, on that, or related to that, maybe more this way, um, however that happens to go. Um, the, oh, uh, group by frame I talked about, uh, that was cool, and we're about hiding data URLs for now. But the relationship between these things goes back to, that's where I was going, haha, -ha, took a minute, but I got there, which was, we talked a little bit about XHR breakpoints. So as I mentioned earlier, we can actually add breakpoints on this, so if we wanted to, we can say, please do a breakpoint for me anytime that something contains the word post. And now if I click that button, I get a breakpoint because it knows I'm about to make a network request out for something that contained the word post. So I can do some pretty cool things um, in terms of what I can actually do in the relationship back to the source again, in terms of how these breakpoints actually work and interrelate with each other. All make sense? Um, the only last thing I'll show you on this front here and then I'll take any questions that uh, you would like uh, is that there is a whole level, which is a whole level itself, of memory profiling and things that can actually happen inside of here. I will touch on this for just the, giving you the basic summary of what's going on, and then maybe we'll, we'll hit this too really quickly. Actually, you know what? Let's do that because it's fun. Let's go to uh, Yahoo real quick and we'll go to application. And um, it will actually give us, in terms of this, continue to do, we have the ability to do this thing called audit. It's kind of fun for a moment. And we'll see how this works over my little uh, MyFi thing. But this is uh, the last two things I just want to show you. I'm going to show you this one really quickly in memory. Audit actually goes through and is reading your web page and looking for sort of common things that it needs to do, including best practices, accessibility, search engine optimization, simulation, what it looks like on different devices, which you'll see it trying over here on the left hand side. Now, it's simulated, but Here's the information it gives you for a free tool that happens to be stuck inside of every version of Chrome all of you are already running. This is the amount of information it gave you back, including where it had problems, uh, input latency, how long it took until the first thing was rendered, performance metrics, diagnostic, progressive web app information, so on and so forth for everything that happened to be there for, for free if you click on the tab. 
Um, okay, so I'll leave that for a minute. Um, and some, for some reason, I pick on Yahoo a lot in my presentations. Um, but the uh, last two things in here, uh, and I'll mainly talk about uh, from the top, side down. Uh, memory snapshotting and memory performance is a huge topic in profiling. But we can think of memory profiling in very much the same way as you saw that little performance profiling screen that I did a minute ago, which is that if we go back here and we go back to my example, you know, let's do this real quick. I'll go to round six, and round six is my one where I'm just pumping out some network requests, okay? Um, all right, good. So memory profiling is the idea that I can understand the difference in what happened in memory between where I'm at at this moment and after doing something, where I'm at again, and then compare the difference in what's actually happening inside of memory. So I can compare the difference in a number of ways in terms of growth, in terms of what objects are allocated. And I can do this by basically saying, I would like to look at, for instance, objects allocated between those two snapshots, or objects allocated before this snapshot, or any combination that I want to, um, including doing comparison and containment pieces. Now again, this is showing us a couple of interesting things. New objects created, the number that were deleted, the delta in total objects, the amount of size those are taking, how much was allocated, how much was freed, and then the size delta between the work that I just did. Okay, so in this side note, we can actually see a whole heck of a lot of information in terms of what we see or what we want to look at in terms of uh, both snapshots were here. Now, if we actually are looking at a comparison, we see some statistics, we see different ones, or at least a little different, if we're actually looking at an individual snapshot by itself. So here we have a bunch of garbage collection and really cool information that's going on, including any of these objects, shallow size, so just like the shallow versus uh, aggregate call before, shallow size are objects that, how big the object actually is, and because of the way garbage collection works, which is basically spidering, if you can reach an object, it has to stay in memory, Retain size is how much stuff that the object is forcing to stay in memory, okay? So I might be pretty small, but if I'm an array that has nothing but pointers to really big gaps of memory, I'm gonna keep a lot in memory even though I'm relatively small, okay? We can see the distance, which is basically how close to the top of um, how many objects down or what's our pathway to the root. And then we can dive into any of these inf pieces of information too, and we can actually see, we'll do this one instead. Um, we can actually get out of here for a second we can actually see things like the array and where the array was allocated and what things holds inside of it um, as we go diving down into more and more of this sort of, of information. Now, again, I always say this too, one thing to keep in mind is that if you are actually doing a memory profiling, you generally want to disable all of your extensions and probably run it in incognito mode because everything uses memory <laughs> and understand that I'm getting all sorts of bleed over in terms of what I'm seeing at the moment. But it's pretty neat, the level that you can get down into in terms of what it's actually showing you um, inside of these snapshots. So you can think about it from one side, which is uh, the performance one does, incidentally, have um, an ability when I'm doing performance that I can tell it that I want to see a memory timeline. But that memory timeline is more about when and how much memory was allocated. The memory tab is about what's allocating the memory, what's in memory, and what are the differences between versions and snapshots over time of what's, what's actually exists, okay? So the two are interrelated, but we're really looking at that memory versus profile, or performance versus, it used to be called profile, but memory versus performance versus network versus console versus sources versus elements. And how the idea is, is that they kind of work across each other to be able to provide interactivity, all starting from what we have, which is a very physical medium, or physical, a very visual medium of being able to see buttons and pieces to the code that might generate them, the code that might interact with them, the code that is generated by them, or the network request that might happen because of them, or to create them, what the performance impact on those things are, how much memory I retained, and all of the things that go with it back and forth. Make sense? And those are all the free things that I talked about that are buried in Chrome. And remember, anytime that anyone gets bored and can't sleep at night, you can just go through all of those too, uh, which will give you some more information on uh, these sorts of things that you can, and in fact, get through um, and what is getting you for free, and tools that are just copies in there. And honestly, we covered a small percentage of what's actually in here. Now, cool thing is, 
all of these things actually have really cool help files. The bad thing is the help files tend to be about a month or two behind. Um, so you've seen how frequently Chrome updates, which most likely means if you need a help file on basic stuff, you'll find it. If you read a help file on something like some of the more intricate profiling things, they'll mention something and then you'll get frustrated because you'll go there and not be able to find it. But it will be there. It'll just be somewhere new because someone had a brilliant idea in the UI department and moved it to a new submenu. Um, and that was very important. But it's there, and there's really cool things, and the help docs are actually very good to be able to understand what's going on inside there. So, how's that sound as a starting point? Questions? Quiet. It's either good or bad. You brushed over the application tab. What's just the. Yeah, this is, this is most useful for progressive web apps um, or apps that actually run inside a browser. So, from here, I can see a number of things. When you, when you declare a progressive web app, which is actually really interesting, because now uh, you can even uh, submit these to like the Android Play Store as individual applications. But they're just a web app that's packaged up with a manifest file. Okay? So we can see details about the manifest. We can see details about any service worker threads that we're spinning off to do additional work in the background. All of these things have the ability to use local storage. We have two DVs built into Chrome at this point that you're allowed to be able to interact with and store things in. And that can happen not just from um, you know, these sort of these things, but for, from uh, aggressive web apps. But I can actually access these from any uh, browser. So in here, I can actually store information locally in your browser. More than just cookies, I can actually store a decent chunk of database data if I want to that's related to a web page. It's sandboxed to be in my web page and at, available via my URL, but I can actually store information there so when you come back, I have actual information that's available both online or offline, which actually leads us down to here, which is the fact that I can actually have and determine what is going to be stored offline in case you revisit my page or my application, realistically in this case, when you're not online and what I want to do. So the only bad thing, although this is getting better, is that the reason that we see a couple of things like session storage versus index DB versus web SQL is that we, of course, have multiple browser vendors who have their own opinions on how each one of these things should be implemented. And so therefore, you know, if, if one standard is good, several are better. Um, <laughs> so until, of course, we just get a standard to fix the standard problems. Um, so, uh, but that is what the application tags for. It's for basically all those nuances of how you might write a web page that's more intended the application oriented. Cool. Make sense? <coughs> Other questions? All right. Well, there you go. Oh, I got one. I have more of a statement. Yeah. Because uh, you didn't touch on it, but on the sources tab, um, you were talking about how it's live code. You can actually save using Control S, which I find powerful. <coughs> yes. So let's actually just briefly talk, talk about it. Um, part of this is setting up, if we're going to do this, you'll see this whole file system piece and this add a folder to a workspace. This is if you really wanted to do something that was a little more IDE-like, and sometimes there are good reasons to do this. You can give uh, Chrome permissions over a local directory, and it'll ask you first. But once you've given it permission over that directory, you can edit files from that directory, and you can save them back, which means that you can actually be doing live editing of your code and actually saving CSS and HTML and JavaScript changes back right from within Chrome. So although it's not, in my opinion, the best IDE in the world for doing it, it is sure as hell convenient. Um, and you get the live interactivity of actually seeing what's happening in real time. Um, incidentally, this Chrome uh, sort of environment for doing debugging is also available in a number of tools. This is VS Code. Um, and VS Code will actually allow you to talk to the Chrome debugger. So from within my IDE here, I can actually set breakpoints and evaluate what's going on in Chrome and get feedback on all the variables and all of the information that's happening here. So I can kind of go both directions. Um, I can do it all within Chrome, or I can use an IDE and talk to Chrome. Both are pretty cool. Do they have a, a facility under sources or somewhere to like um, unwind an HTML that's just... I like the word unwind. Had all the white space stripped out of it just to irritate the world? <laughs> not, not in here. Well, there is for, so let's actually look at two things. First of all, we have pretty print, which is partially what you mean. Okay. So down there, that, that pair is going to, uh, even something fairly convoluted is going to do that too. And uh, so any place that we're actually can pretty print something, we'll get it there. One caveat, 
for particularly long files. 3D print is particularly slow uh, because it's basically trying to dynamically re-render uh, some relatively complicated formatting because it's basically parsing that thing apart and then reformatting for you. It works really well for small things and then works so great for long things. Um, however, there are a number of tools, uh, especially for JavaScript in the open source world, which are pretty cool, including a website that'll let you do some uh, prettifying of uh, sort of compressed and minified content. One or two of them are actually pretty neat because they're machine learning engines that read all of the open source projects on GitHub and everywhere else to get a general sense of, huh, when somebody accesses this API, they're usually doing it with a video, so I should rename this property video. And they actually do a pretty good job of getting close to something readable. Not perfect, but pretty good. So just on a side note, that stuff's coming uh, along further. It's kind of funny because it's like uh, radar detectors versus radar guns uh, sort of thing, where there's the arms race. Uh, the minifiers are really good, and now the deminifiers are getting better. Uh, so it'll just be a work processing speed at some point to see how, how, uh, how we can get it there. Anything else? All right. Well, good. Thank you.